Uh, my name is Danny Yu. I'm a managing partner um, with Momenta Partners. We are a firm focusing on connected industry, the digitization of traditional industries, things like energy, manufacturing, supply chain, um, smart spaces, so business to business applications. And within that, we uh, provide advisory to large companies. Um, we also help these companies find talent, and then also we do make venture investments. So uh, I'm based here in the Valley. Oh, God, someone joining us. What's your name, you? You right, doing. <laughs> uh, so, <clears throat> and my background is as an entrepreneur and, and uh, venture capitalist. Oops. Hey, nice hey, to meet you, Danny. Nice to meet you. We started earlier. Oh, we started a little early. Yeah. Uh, so, within connected industry, you know, we're looking at how do you take something that's physical, hyper physical, hyper local, and how does it get transformed with connectivity, with the Internet of Things, sensors, and then software. So, um, having done that and built and sold a company, GE, we've kind of experienced that. So, um, have some thoughts, but the specific use cases. You know, we're most interested in are those where there's a parallelization of decentralization via the Internet of Things already. Um, things like energy is highly decentralized now with um, locally based renewable technology. And then opportunities where location services and, and physical products like supply chain can, very, can be disrupted. And so when you look at those applications, blockchain tying into the Internet of Things are very applicable for um, discrete relationships between customers and suppliers, as an example, but also, I think, wholesale business model changes. So those are areas that we're, uh, we're interested in. Cool, cool, cool. So, but now let's turn to Internet of Things. <laughs> so, uh, guys, what are the great user cases? So uh, there is an anecdotal uh, case that uh, refrigerator sells information to groceries. Um, what what is uh, eaten away from a refrigerator? So they send food to uh, to 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 home household, and this uh, kind of helps them with marketing. What are other big cases? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so you know when I look at IoT, I look at it like through the lens of a you know municipality, because IoT a lot of IoT devices you know whether it be with GE GE talks to a city, the city puts it out there, right? the city has an internal team that is essentially tasked with aggregating data to create insights, which in turn they're looking to convert in some form of quality of life. It's typically the, the kind of route uh, that they take. Um, so, you know, I think that from a, from a use case, from a blockchain standpoint, you know, it could be as transformative or as non-transformative as, you know, the people that shuttle it into our lives. So, you know, in a utopian world, right, you have all these devices. So a big case against IoT from a, you know, from a civic standpoint is that they're, it's largely tax funder based or uh, funded, right? So citizens pour in their tax money. Um, governments then in turn procure the devices from GE. They put them in, or not just GE, but like, you know, just uh, vendors, let's just say vendors, uh, and then put it out there. So the ROI for the citizen is very hard for them to understand. It's very hard for them to, to calculate, right? Um, it's not as easy if they sit down on Sundays, they see their football team play, they won, they lost. It's very, they have a very linear relationship with like sports. Whereas IoT, they don't understand it. So with blockchain, let's say it's just say in a utopian uh, space, you tokenized all the devices. Like I threw out, I recycled this, you know, can of Coke, I get paid. I passed through this traffic light, I got paid. But I think um, where rubber meets the road is, you know, how, how much are these, you know, I guess vendors going to bend on their business model, right? Um, whether that be from, you know, the gas that is used, right? That comes at a cost from an authentication standpoint. Um, how much trust do cities actually have devices that are basically executing on smart contracts, uh, which are heavily dependent on the data that goes into it? So let's just say there is like some, something that connects the dots and there's a public safety issue. Who's to blame? Am I blaming the vendor? Am I blaming the city? If I'm blaming the city, what's the... So there's a lot of these... Um, very realistic scenarios uh, that haven't really been formulated from a financial standpoint, but also from a, um, a, uh, a risk um, uh, mitigation standpoint as well, which I think will basically tell the story. So that's probably my, uh, and then this is probably a very city-centric way of looking at it, but that's, but that's my, my experience with municipalities and councils and so forth. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, let me put my, um, game theory professor hat on me and 
tr try to maybe start the discussion here also uh, among the panelists about uh, how do we create a set of incentives? How do we basically put together a set of the rules uh, which kind of bind uh, blockchain and IoT so that um, uh, essentially right people do right things and uh, wrong people and wrong players get left out of the game? Sort of going back to what uh, you just said, uh, how do we create safe environment where uh, incentives of all the players involved of, uh, you know, uh, of uh, people who own the data, people who own the devices, people who are manufacturers, they, they're compatible. And uh, again, as I would teach my students in a the game theory class, result in a good Nash equilibrium. So uh, w what are those rules? Uh, and uh, the great news uh, now is that uh, basically we, we're starting from ground zero. We really very rarely you see any sort of regulations which would be uh, restrictive, which would apply sort of uniformly to uh, all kinds of uh, products across the board. So we can really influence the governments uh, with knowledge, with experience, with the data in hands. The, the bad news, of course, is that uh, there are too many governments out there, and they are different. <laughs> and, uh, you know, since uh, blockchain is such a widely distributed uh, network, uh, who knows what, you know, Chinese have in mind as opposed to, say, Estonians. And uh, those can have totally different regulations, which, again, in the end can result in uh, some right regulations resulting in... Um, Though, uh, for example, uh, privacy being preserved in the right way, being completely distorted uh, through some other country's regulations. So uh, it's sort of like in international relations. There is no international law that all the countries are abiding by. Therefore, it's very difficult to imagine there will be some sort of uniform set of rules and regulations. But if we can think of some uh, set of rules which are self-induced and create right incentives, then uh, we can actually uh, be looking into the future of the fusion between blockchain and IoT with more optimism. So Alexander, what do you think? I, I, I think it's game theory fascinates me. So um, there are some regulations, obviously GDPR, which is fairly recent. Um, the ICO, not an initial coin offering, the, the inter um, Commission Office, the Information Commission Office, have quite widely come out and said that blockchain irrevocably is perhaps somewhat against GDPR. Why? Because if there's personal identifiable information that perhaps a sensor may, may pick up, and then we put that onto a distributed ledger, are we moving that information outside of the EU? Most probably. So when you say universal, the GDPR affects everybody. Every country, if you're processing information on a European citizen, you have to abide by GDPR. In answer to the incentivization part of game theory, this for me is very interesting because it's about governance. Who owns the data? Is a particular stakeholder going to own the information? Who's got the interest in building that ecosystem? Does it come from you know, members of the public? Does it come from an organization that probably spent a huge amount of money on building their supply chain? Um, do they have an interest in completely rebooting their systems? What's the capital expenditure that's going to be needed to build, for example, supply chain on the blockchain? And who, where does it come from? And I think, for example, if you look at smart cities, is there an interest from the public sharing that space? Is there an interest for them to have uh, you know, transparency in a supply chain? Probably. If I'm picking up food, I probably want to know if it's been transported in the right way. Can the government use tokenization and incentives of perhaps I want to report traffic jam? Um, you know, I want people to know that there's a traffic jam here. Maybe I get paid because I'm incentivized by a token to report that information, right? Does that have an interest for the people living in the, in, in the city? Well, of course it does. So this is an interesting point. I think, I think it really comes down to who owns the data. 
I think it comes also down to the ROI, Minghao, we, we spoke about this. Is there a use case right now that really shows the return on investment for putting a supply chain on, on blockchain? I'm not so sure. I think uh, I'll comment on that. So I think a lot of the time, you know, uh, the buyers of IoT, uh, they typically articulate ROI in terms of costs that they've streamlined for themselves. Right, so like you could argue that you know you turn everything digital. We don't use these documents anymore. We saved uh, two million dollars on our city budget. Right, so I think that in terms of blockchain intersecting with IoT, the, the the dynamic in which we kind of determine or justify value has to shift to the actual users within the city providing the data. And I think to kind of backtrack on what you were saying is that I think all roads actually lead back to the vendor. Right, it, you know the city does its job in procuring it. But to, to create a equitable distribution of wealth, uh, which blockchain is intended to do in the IoT space, you know, if, if you have someone earning money off what this vendor provides where they previously didn't have to worry about that, you know, it's like a dance. I move, you move. They move, I move, right? So, I, and I'm not totally convinced that they'd be willing to move in that direction, not because they're bad people. They, they, I, you know, they, people that sit within these organizations are wonderful people. But these organizations have a very specific mandate. You know, they take in capital. They have to convert that capital into shareholder value. And you don't do that by basically, you know, relinquishing, you know, massive amounts of your business model for really n nothing in return outside of, you know, basically the people that provide you your business prior to that are actually getting funded for it. So I think that's a, you know, it's a bit of conundrum. You know, I, I, I don't have the answer either. Yeah. I'll put uh, some ideas out here. I think we talked earlier about how blockchain is also social technology, right, in terms of now tr how trust gets distributed in addition to being, frankly, a ledger technology. So if you think about applying that to a business-to-business -business context, which is where um, I tend to spend my time, think about brands, you know, like an Apple or someone that has um, a large user base that is promoting a certain way of thinking about how to use products. They talk a lot about data and how they keep you know, use the minimum amount. I think we're moving from an era of um, conspicuous consumption, you know, people having things, to what they call conspicuous production, where people care about how things are made. Were they made in a um, socially conscious environment? Were workers treated properly? I think there's a lot of press around factories in which consumer electronics were, were produced. So some of these brands who have supply chains, you can imagine, and they're sensing, you know, where were these products sourced? I mean, I think the traditional one that consumers think about are the food. So Chipotle, you know, lettuce, I think, or there's a lettuce poisoning recently. <laughs> so that's an obvious one. We all care about our health, but I think if you want to look more broadly around the economy, anything that's manufactured where there's a brand value um, and the importance of, from a consumer side, how that's made or industrial because of the, perhaps a life safety situation where you need to track components through the, that's ROI because they need to track that. If there's a problem, someone gets fired. <laughs> there's a direct relation. So I think those are areas in which you can start seeing the pull for blockchain-based solutions, probably tied with other IoT uh, technologies that need to evolve more cost-effectively to you know, get a wheel rolling because you, what you're saying was right. Historically, a lot of the IoT solutions have been single user. I get it in my own RI, but with blockchain, because it's ledger, it has to be pulled through across entities. So you have to say, where is that pull coming from? Just, just leading, leading on to that as well, and I think being an IoT panel, I think it's important for people to understand, you know, why would we implement blockchain in, in, in IoT and, for example, sensors? If I'm perhaps giving data input as a human about the temperature control, let's say, of a logistics company or trucking company, for example, for food, the point is, is we're saying, okay, we've got a, a sensor that isn't prone to human error. Right, so this going back to back to trust. When you talk about accountability, um, looking at this from a hacker's point of view, um, relying on hardware manufacturers, right, for security is a bit like riding into the wild west on a pony with a water pistol. Right, yeah. fucked. Excuse my <laughs> French. <laughs> If, if I'm able to compromise a hardware device that is inputting data into that immutable ledger, and I use the word immutable, this goes again down to governance. 
what's the censorship of data going into the ledger? And if it's immutable, what if I have bad data going into that ledger? How do I remove it? So for me, this is maybe contradictory of what we consider blockchain as, as an immutable record. Do we need some kind of editable blockchain? Whereas if in the extent that there has been a compromise sensor or device, that's putting bad data into the to the record. How one? How do we get rid of it? And what's the censorship and governance over the data going into the ledger? That that for me is something that you know. Yes, I can see the merits of putting supply chain on on the blockchain for accountability, traceability. But who decides what data goes in, and what happens when there's bad data in the ledger? Because, because then I could make it look like anybody I want. You know, like the, the DNC hack and, and, and Russia. I mean, it clearly probably wasn't Russia because it was so obvious. And this is just a classic case of how a hacker is going to use a guising technique. Of course, I'm not going to say it's me. I'm going to put it on somebody else. Can, can someone, when you talk about accountability, do that? And then you've got someone who's being fined or held up as accountable and loses his job. And it's like, <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> Yeah, this is, uh, by the way, uh, both of those points are great. I'm actually uh, very sympathetic to what uh, you just said, because in fact, uh, I am working with the company which does exactly this uh, fusion between blockchain and uh, food retail industry, where uh, the issue of trust is essentially beca quickly becoming a real social issue, becoming one of the sort of key components in uh, consumer choice. And uh, that's what's driving uh, those, you know, big retail chains to uh, start at least thinking about adopting this technology. Uh, not because they see immediate ROE on this one, but because they understand that at some point the social tide against those who don't adopt it can be, can basically outweigh the, uh, uh, the costs of uh, implementing this right now. And yeah, and of course, uh, and, and, and as far as, um, uh, you know, the uh, the hacking and the security. And look, that's going to be the arms race uh, as it's basically the arms race in any other uh, industry where where you have basically bad guys going against good guys. Uh, somebody's going to invent, you know, some way of hacking that no matter how hard we try to prevent it. And then eventually, uh, well, it will either converge to the situation where sort of hacking is marginal and the costs of that are accepted, or the technology is going to be either thrown away or replaced by some other technology. One of those three things are gonna happen. I don't think we can figure out an absolutely foolproof mechanism of uh, storing data. Uh, it's uh, been, uh, anybody who invents that is gonna get, you know, Nobel Prize for the following several years, I believe. Uh, but, but, but again, I think the, the interesting question is, what should be, uh, what's really the role, what's the connection between the vendors, like you say, and the government? How can they sort of work together to make sure that this process is sort of least painful and uh, you know, most effective? That's what's interesting here. So I actually have a, more of a comment on that because it's funny because, you know, the better the relationship with the government and the vendor, Technically speaking, if you have these devices working on smart contracts and they're executing on all sorts of, you know, just all sorts of stuff, the, the one complaint you typically people have about governments being the custodian of such devices is that all roads lead back to them to create insights. So if you have smart contracts saying, acting on them, they basically work themselves out of a job. So, um, so I, and that's a thing, right? You know, if you're a government worker and you have an innovation team, basically you're in there, in most cases, nine to five, to create insights off data, because um, that's the, the the direction the digital economy has gone. You know, we depend on basically, we you know, there was a time that we got you know we created town halls, we got together. You know, this whole term "hug it out," people actually did that. Like that was part of the rules within the town. So, uh, and then as that can be it got replaced by devices. You know, gov you know, governments saw other governments procuring all these devices, and that's their job to create insights. And one thing that actually you mentioned that I think is also key: blockchain doesn't fix flawed procurement models, right? Blockchain doesn't just come in and fix it all, right? So typically these 
uh, procurements are very siloed, and it's even happening already. So there's a lot of you know uh, companies out there that are not catching the wave of blockchain, but you know finding ways to embed that within their kind of sales, which they should. You know every you know every company has a sales and marketing arm to it, and they've used blockchain as a way to kind of not upsell, but find different ways to interact with governments with a new suite of products. Um, so, you know, with, with that said, you have a lot of identity vendors now approaching governments. And what you have are governments still with siloed procurement models procur procuring identity vendors, right? So let's just use like Austin, Texas, for example. You have one use case, homelessness. There's rampant homelessness in Austin, Texas, as is the case of many, many major cities. So when you look at homelessness, what are you trying to solve with it? Oh, we, we, need them to, we want them all to have medical records. So that's a use case with an end outcome. Then another company is like, oh, we want homelessness, but we want them to, to have banking, right? So that's homelessness with another end outcome. So all of a sudden, you have two departments within the same government that have procured two different identity solutions to solve the same problem, albeit outcomes that are slightly related that you could just accomplish at the same time. So... You know, and then when you were talking about, I think you mentioned Estonia, and like, you know, you're making basically the point about countries. A, a big term with CIOs, I don't know what your experience is, is in interoperability, right? Huge, huge term for them, right? And, you know, using an example just without blockchain, Columbus, Ohio. So they want to basically a smart city challenge. Federal government it doesn't get more top down than that. They have 80 million to create smart transport, right? So if you go to Columbus, like, oh, man, there's all these, like, interesting things going on. Go to Cincinnati, they have no clue what you're talking about. So interoperability is a huge thing that has not been addressed um, due to lack of common standards. And I would argue that blockchain, in a way, actually amplifies the problem versus actually improves it. So it's just something to be wary of, albeit I do quite like smart contracts eliminating you know, probably non-technical innovation teams within city halls making the decisions. So, you know, pros and cons to everything. And interoperability, I agree, is, is, a, is a key key area. I think there are some, some companies here that are working on this and perhaps even solved this issue. I think it's important to be adaptive. I think, you know, there's going to be, we've discussed, I heard from Reese this morning about there's going to be a lot of blockchains depending on the utilization of it. How do we get those to communicate together? Medical records, banking, this, this brings up issues of privacy. It is certainly PII. How do we create not only interoperability between passing that data, how do we also make sure that we're protecting the person whose data it might be? And, and this is for me where privacy really sort of trumps security in that way um, without, without question. Yeah, so Given how much, how, uh, how early, I still think IoT is, by the way, at least on the business business side, it is still early days um, on just the single customer use case to get the ROI. Um, so if you're looking at yet another technology, and I think there are some natural technologies um, that complement IoT like artificial intelligence, frankly, to bring down the cost of some of these solutions. I think blockchain is a to be determined. <laughs> is it going to help? Or how much is it going to be a, a factor? I think not because that it doesn't have the potential, but just because of the practical implementation challenges like interoperability. IoT is a big reason why IoT is not adopted today is the lack of interoperability today. So if blockchain is also in privacy, and I think when you when you take something that's not interoperable and that's it, it needs to form its base, then you add something else that has interesting technology capabilities, but is also uh, non-interoperable in terms of the technologies, much less the applications, I think that's where there's going to be a bit of a wait and see. So I believe that from a use case perspective, it's going to take, you know, as often the case, a large customer who controls either their energy landscape or their supply chain, who basically says, I'm going to have a permission-based blockchain substitute for something I used to do. Maybe it used to be their EDI system for, you know, working with vendors and they said, no, I can, some vendors done a blockchain based EDI replacement that's cost effect. You know, some of these things are going to be the first implementations. They're not, they're obviously they don't have the promise of, you know, full decentralization and the new internet, which I think is, you know, captivating, but in terms of the practical use cases, this is how businesses work. So again, the technology is very interesting. It's going to, we're still very early and there, basically there are no standards. <laughs> and so as a result, it'll take specific customers who have a lot of budget and weight with their customer base or ecosystem to use the technology. Then over time, I think 
success and ROI will generate, you know, kind of de facto standards, as has been the case even going back to the Internet 1.0 with, you know, the, the battles over what local area network technology would, would dominate and ultimately Ethernet did. So it's going to be a few years. <laughs> yeah, just, I just, I basically want to support what you just said and make, you know, a couple comparisons which essentially we just witnessed in the last, you know, several months, which I think are very kind of indicative of what can, what, what may and will happen with blockchain. Well, uh, because, blo I mean, this uh, intersection between blockchain and IoT sort of touches on a variety of basically everyday life social issues. I think we, we probably should expect to see development somewhat similar to, say, social networking. I mean, look, uh, once, you know, Facebook and, you know, Chinese network and a Russian network showed up, it was great. I mean, you know, people embraced those things and people, you know, thought that, hey, it's like the, the second best thing after sliced bread and everybody uses that. And uh, everybody sort of realizes, yeah, there are all these issues about, you know, privacy and uh, how, how information is used and what's going on. And then eventually something happens and uh, everybody gets sort of a wake-up call and everybody realizes that there is kind of our understanding of, you know, social networking 2.0. And that's kind of where we are now, but it took, what, about 10 years, right, before uh, that wake-up call happened. So my guess is that same thing is going to happen with blockchain and this, you know, socially sensitive data. And uh, again, the, the IoT is a great example. Uh, whatever we say here, uh, those things are going to be evolving and uh, there will be companies which will adopt that and there will be governments like you say, you know, uh, say in Columbus, you know, they, they all love it and uh, then eventually, you know, some city in Kansas is going to adopt it and then some, you know, and others won't. But uh, they're going to, uh, uh, th there will be lots of pain because eventually at some place uh, there will be a major screw up and uh, like, you know, happened with Facebook, for example, and somebody is going to say, gee, uh, that, can, that touches all of us. So, so how do we fix that? And then there will be some 2.0. Again, it's probably going to take years and we just should be ready for that. But what we should also be ready for to invest our efforts and uh, money, and that's what for the governments into research, into better understanding how this works, and to create better incentives. And I think I think that's an interesting opportunity for for young companies here, because if you look at you know obviously the amount of resource, money, time that's gone into building a trusted supply chain and then managing a very complex multi-vendor ecosystem, which has got to be from large organisations mm -hmm. or even governments. Is the decentralization of that essentially taking away one of their main stances on being a big organization? I have the supply chain. It's a trusted supply chain. Who's going to be the first mover? And this is where I think for, for perhaps an ICO or, or a new blockchain company to come in, use game theory to bootstrap that, that ecosystem. Because from an economic point of view, there's two things that I can see blockchain be... be perhaps interesting for one is cost of verification right which means that you know, we're verifying ourselves the attributes when you buy something that creates efficiency we can use blockchain to, to perhaps eliminate that need uh, that cost and then you've got cost of networking um, and this for me is where really game theory starts to be you know way beyond blockchain blockchain is just a distributed ledger I mean it, it, its application is how we use it and I think in IoT, it's not the technology that's the issue. The technology's been around for, for 10 years now. It's the implementation of it that's the struggle. It's the governance aspects of it. And, and who's going to be the, the, the mover in it? And I, and I think this is a great opportunity for, for young companies to actually use game theory, the blockchain aspects, and actually come in here and, and perhaps get members of the public to be the guys that are actually becoming the, the key investors because they're, they're, they're incentivized. That for me is a, a great opportunity for, for young companies to come in here. Yeah, I think the, we haven't reached mass adoption of IoT and there is, the technology has been available but it's still, the cost and complexity of the deployment is still high 
So someone that solves that part of the IoT problem combined with the disruptiveness of, wow, all, you ha all of a sudden, no one's had that, no one's connected to these devices or inventory pieces, super low cost combined with the potential of data, you know, never before possible data creates, you know, a huge set of opportunities for incentives. But, uh, so it's, that, it's a bit like peanut butter and gel. You need both to kind of come together in the right application to drive that, and that's, you're right, it's the case of young companies. Some guy, gigantic company who's got a, you know existing supply chain, yeah, he can use it to optimize this, but is he really disrupting this business model? No, I mean, he is leveraging distributed ledger. He's basically making himself more efficient, um, which is actually the first use of IoT for big companies was, okay, now I can do predictive maintenance on my own equipment. But the companies that disrupted IoT are the ones who basically came in as a pure software company and then said, no, I'm gonna disrupt all the hardware players. Um, and so I think that, we gotta keep in mind, IoT is about things. Now it's things with people in real-time context that that combination, lower cost, real-time context, and blockchain, I think is going to be a you know, great place for startups. And so um, something that I'm you know, very interested in, in seeing develop. Yes, and uh, I, I actually fully agree with that. It's, it's an interesting panel. We really, we really seem to agree with each other, right? <laughs> uh, what, uh, what I think is uh, also very important is uh, that um, we, like Alexander said, we look at places where uh, the, the demand for trust is the highest. I mean, because really, the, the biggest benefit of blockchain is uh, trust, uh, increase in uh, essentially traceability of you know, goods, uh, product development, you name it, right? And <clears throat> the effectiveness of networking. But, but, but trust is the key issue. So <clears throat> that's, that's where the highest benefit is. That's kind of purely sort of game theoretic economic uh, vision can actually help. And when you look at places where <clears throat> trust is uh, sort of, we, we, we lack trust. I mean, that's probably like food retail industry, I agree with this. This is, uh, you know, the uh, various contracts were, which, you know, where the government money is spent. This is, uh, you know, uh, various, uh, I, I work in education. I know there is lots of uh, problems with trust in uh, university systems in terms of quality of education and uh, what kind of university you pick and how much you pay, that type of stuff, I, I believe, blockchain is gonna be there. So, so essentially, if we were to predict, if we were to have like a crystal ball of uh, what's gonna happen in the next few years, I think that's the areas where the trust is the biggest problem, is going to kind of outweigh the potential uh, negative impact of blockchain in IoT. So we'll see, I mean, it's, uh, it's just a prediction, but uh, it's also an experiment. Actually, interesting point you made, because basically the people that sell into governments, it typically takes on one of two personas. It's either an enterprise or a heavily VC-backed GovTech startup, right? That has, because that's really what you need. You need money to withstand the lead time associated with the RV, but there's no other way. Um, so it's just, how, it's just how it has to be structured. And I think you made an interesting point with, you know, ICOs and these companies coming out. But I, I made a few observations so far, and I think each this observation kind of entails a certain lead time associated with that as well. Where I find that there's a lot of ICOs like, we're going to tackle the whole logistics industry, and all, you know. And I feel like that's just a really long path to nowhere, basically. An expensive one, you know, because a lot of them have like, you know, 30 million, 40, you know, pretty decent money behind them, right? So I think we're going to go through this phase. Uh, because we need to reach the end point that you suggested. But to do that, I think you're going to have to see a lot of these ICOs basically try and fail a lot, uh, basically realize that, uh, bind together to mesh network effects, and then have some kind of you know, um, combined solution uh, that, that accounts for enough of you know, a, a supply chain that governments are actually investing in to procure services for. And I think like any company, you just need to go through that cycle. So I think that cycle, the very least, takes three years, then integrate. So I think, I think it's at least five years till, you know, some of the companies that we're seeing today that are looking to address, you know, very much in need uh, global su supply chain for their services, actually formulate a solution as part of a cohesive unit that could actually be procured because that's the only way it actually makes money. It's procured, right? So, and I think that's, um, that's the, the end goal that we need to reach. 
and whatever we can do to kind of incentivize these ICOs to be less kind of enthralled with disrupting something because they know it needs to be disrupted and more kind of focused on, okay, yeah, exactly. Maybe like some more peer review, whatever it really takes to kind of refine the execution model uh, that just basically doesn't have to be winner take all, um, but basically, you know, finds others to, to basically get over the wave together. Yeah, I think uh, given my own background is more in uh, traditional tech financing companies where you're, you know, you're talking to founders and they have technology and they're solving specific problems versus the ICO market, which is, uh, fan, you know, it's, I was a venture guy in 1999. So this, hey, <laughs> it's kind of fun. I remember those days. Uh, now it's gotten a lot more focused around minimum viable product, right? What is the problem you're solving? Who is your customer? Make it a great product. Make it a great experience and hit the pain point. So if you raise all the money in the world, you know, guess what? There's lots of venture back companies in 1999 who raised tons of money. They're no longer in business because they never had a business model. So it's not about raising the money. It's about solving the problem because the product has to be procured and solve a problem that, that is high enough on the priority list for that person for them to do this. Um, and so I think the, the important thing for all these companies is to you know, solve that problem. And I think obviously the token economics may be helping because they're trying to create some incentives. So this is a new tool in the kit that hasn't been available before. Uh, that said, it's also experimental. And so I think ultimately so, you know, developing a you know, software enabled product that you know, is iterated on, you find a customer, you know, keep your burn low, or keep, don't spend money until you have the customer is a very common theme for you know, venture backed startups. And I'm, I, I haven't seen that discipline yet with ICO backed companies, we'll see. I think we're in a sort of block, well, we're most certainly in blockchain frenzy right now, where you stick blockchain on anything and suddenly you've got $30 million in the bank. Uh, I totally agree with you that we need to, and this is going to be a transition, we're still in the fairly nascent stages of heavy investments. But yeah, there's, there's got to be some more thought on the business model. I ask a lot of ICOs, what's your business model? And you kind of get open, open stairs. Uh, and I think the main key here is to realize that it is about problems and it's blockchain is just a platform, right? It's, it's not the savior of, of it. how we use it is going to be the savior. And unless there's a clear problem that we're going to solve, you can't solve all the problems of the world overnight, right? So, so looking at small niche areas that we can see some ICOs focusing on a particular problem, whether it's food supply, whether it's pharmaceutical supply, which is a huge deal. You know. It could be interesting to talk about when we maybe look at you know, Bitcoin and double, double spend and it solves that. Same with, with pharmaceutical and, and fraudulent drugs. I mean, that, that's a huge area where I can see blockchain actually solve a problem and not just stick a supply chain on, on the blockchain for efficiency. Right. I get efficiency. I, we've been talking about, you know, I've been in the, also work with a lot of CIOs and over the last few years we've gone from, you know, artificial intelligence, big data, and now suddenly blockchain, right? right? Actually how many of these companies have implemented a solution and most of the drivers efficiency. Right? Companies, unless it saves them money, they don't want to spend. Technology was sort of finished in 1990 when we started op automating transaction processing systems. Right? Companies were like, right, technology's done its job. And then, of course, we had consumerization, and suddenly it was all about engagement and applications, and we all started employing UX and UI designers. Right? So in terms of actually... Um, the implementation of a real solution. Um, I'm, yet to, I'm yet to really see uh, a company kind of tackle a real, real world problem. I'd love to talk a little bit about your thoughts on pharmaceuticals because I think that's a big area that isn't solving efficiency. It's solving a really big problem that could potentially kill, kill someone. You know, you get, you get a drug that perhaps is tampered with in some way, someone may die. Now that for me is a real solution beyond just yeah. creating digital, uh, using digitalization for efficiency, which is I'd like to see some more solutions focused around improving people's lives, improving humanity, and not all about cost savings. Right. I think that's the real deal here with blockchain. 
uh, we kind of diverging from the public blockchain and ICO kind of markets into the uh, permission blockchains. Uh, does it basically dictate that we need to we need we need governance? You know, when I talk to these folks, they talk about governance. Stability of the chain is very important. You want to prevent takeovers and everything. So, so you from the very beginning you have kind of uh, consortium based blockchain. Is this a necessity for the IoT? Well, um, let me just say a couple of words and then I'll let my uh, colleagues uh, continue. Uh, I think uh, as far as, you know, solving those problems that we talked about, it's probably a necessity. I'm pretty sure we're going to have, uh, you know, open blockchains out there, plenty of those. But I think a lot of games and a lot of game theory will be employed in this uh, uh fusion between the government and uh, and the companies and uh, in, in IoT business. Just because uh, without that, uh, we're probably going to have chaos. So if I understood the question right, I, I, was it the difference between like, the relationship between permission-based blockchains at the intersection of government and IoT? Okay, yeah. So my thoughts on that are that there's nothing wrong with having a permission-based blockchain um, associated with a procurement model. But if you have, you know, uh, you know, one company around the world doesn't do everything, right? So you need ways, because what the problem that with, with government solutions are, and the reason that citizens really don't buy into them as much as they should, is because the user experience sucks, right? So government, and actually it's oddly enough that the um, uh, Mayor Khan in London, um, he got actually totally blasted for his uh, smart, city, uh, smart City Innovation Roadmap that came out last week. And it's because it doesn't mimic all the other cities that are trying to procure everything under the sun. It's heavily focused on a borough level user experience. So I think permission based blockchain in terms of a procurable model is only a, as effective as how that those permission blockchains um, kind of goes back to our topic around interoperability, um, kind of play nice with the others. Otherwise, you just have another Austin example where you have the homeless solution and two separate vendors trying to accomplish the same thing with the same group, but no one really cares because the user experience is so flawed because of the way it was procured, which comes from the vendors. Right, so that's kind of what it all. It, someone's got to bend, basically. Is the is I think the answer. I'll uh, just add a quick note here. I think that IoT, a lot of that's been procured is actually between businesses, business to business. So the governments have not actually been involved in some of these uh, consortiums, um, in the on the like the um, IIoT as an example. So the to get more because you know at the end of the day all these companies they have to get a return on their R&D for making these products so I think again business based consortiums focused around specific use cases not we're going to solve every blockchain problem on the planet but you know around specific industries they those tend to have the best results which can drive true standardization in you know, in volume yeah I think from you know permission based chains can permission is we're talking about censorship, which is basically saying, okay, th this is interesting because I guess a lot of the permission-based blockchains are about accountability, about having some kind of trust that the input of data is, is verified. We've got to be very careful here when you look about hackable functions, for example, of a smart contract, which is creating those permissions. Because if a hacker can come in and it's about the delegate functions of the smart contract. If I can bypass that, I can perhaps pose as an identity that has that permission. And this is where we start to, it's still cloudy in some, not, not the blockchain itself in terms of security, but the human error that goes into coding the permissions on top of that. That is still in the nascent stages and there are, not a contract on earth that's not going to have some kind of vulnerability in it. And that it's going to keep going. More threat vectors are going to be found, and it's going to continue. Um, I certainly don't, I think a lot of the reasons we've seen the evolution of blockchain is because inherently, you know, millennials are not trusting a centralized bank, centralized government, centralized authority. We're sort of moving away from having to be dependent on them. Um, so this is a good question. Um, I think it's something that there is not really an answer to right now. And, and I think in the future, we're going to start to find the merits of permission-based blockchain, certainly in terms of controlling the data that's going in. 
Um, but we're now sort of almost moving away from decentralization to, to a centralized entity that has some sort of you know, authoritarian power over what goes in the data. So for me, it's a good question, but I, I, I agree with you. I think we really need to start to move away from, from, from government in, the, in these particular areas, because this is about consumer. It's about consumer protection. It's about accountability. Um, and these are things that should be invested by, by, by members of the public. We have an interest to make sure these things are, are safe.